It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 327 of Science on Top. Recorded on Monday the 18th of March 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. G'day Ed. And science educator and performer, our old friend Sean Elliott. Welcome back. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. And before we go on, this is the final week of our 10-week campaign in support of Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation. Late last year, we lost a very close friend and a listener to the show, Penelope Green. These were her preferred charities, and we've been donating all the Patreon contributions we receive to them. So a big thank you to everyone who has chipped in over the last 10 weeks. We've raised about $450, $500. Oh, wow. I won't know for sure until the end of the month. So, yeah, really, really happy with that. It's a wonderful legacy, I guess. Uh, And we'll split that money evenly between the two charities. So thank you everyone for that. And if you still want to donate to keep the podcast going, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate. But first, Sean, you've got something exciting coming up. You're going to be performing at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival again. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Ed. This is your second year doing it, I think. It is. It is. I, I, I had the show The Onion of Knowledge last year. Which was a lot of fun. Ah, thank you. But um, yeah, this year it's completely different. Um, So last year was uh, random science uh, stories, whereas this year I'm focusing entirely on the life and times of Nikola Tesla. And For some reason, I thought you were going to say the life of Brian. I don't know why. <laughs> popped into my head. <laughs> yeah, we're exploring the science and physics behind that classic Monty Python. <laughs> Truly, could well, there is some there's some science fiction involved in that. There's an alien spaceship and everything, but yeah, uh, we've gotten off topic. <laughs> sorry about that. Nikola Tesla, so the inventor of the electric car, is that right? He uh, certainly invented the engine that is running. <laughs> and um, this is uh, in, in, the, in the researching of the show. Um, I've, I've, I've sort of... So, so here's the thing about Tesla is that uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, if, if people have heard of him, they, they usually hear him with the byline, the man who invented the 20th century or something along these lines. Um, and there's a lot of things that are attributed to his name. And in all honesty, I've sat down and gone through a lot of the, uh, the history, and it seems that there's only a few of those things that are attributed, but one of those is something called the induction motor. <coughs> Excuse me, the induction motor. And the in- uh, you see, it tears me up every time. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought it was Thomas Edison reaching out from beyond the grave to shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that upstart. <laughs> anyway, uh, and and because um, you know, if if you cast your mind back to to physics, if you ever looked at motors, you probably perhaps even made a motor at, at school using wire, electricity, and a magnet. Did. And mm-hmm. and so you hook it up to a battery, and and this thing spins around. Uh, but you need the magnet now. What Nikola Tesla did was that not only did he do away with the magnet because he realized that if you get a, uh, a wire and you run electricity along it, it creates its own magnetic field. So why not use a magnetic field created by electricity in a motor? Then you don't need the magnet. But then on top of that, he did a few other things which made this motor um, not only incredibly efficient, but it's, it's said, I remember seeing a figure somewhere that 90% of the world's power goes to powering induction motors around the world because they're used in everything from yeah. fridges, inside a computer, in uh, microwaves. Um, uh, so many of the motors around us are actually of this design that was done by Nikola Tesla. But surrounding him, at that time when he was living was a whole host of other characters. Like, as you just mentioned, Thomas Edison, there was the, uh, uh, a whole, um, uh, 
the rivalry. Yeah. Uh, although if you were to go back and talk to Edison about it, he, he'd probably just kind of wave his hand and say it's, it's, it's really nothing. It, um, a lot of people make a, a big deal about the feud, but nevertheless, it, it is something that really captures our imagination. And the show, we're going to sort of explore some of those things uh, about it. Now, because when I when I think of the Edison Tesla feud or rivalry or whatever you want to call it, uh, I'm always reminded, and I don't want to talk about this too much because it's so horrific. Uh, but Topsy the elephant, um, which was essentially tortured and electrocuted, and t- used by um, Edison as a way of proving that. Tesla's alternating current was dangerous and bad and we should stick to Edison's direct current. Uh, and it was effective for quite a while, actually. Well, the, yeah, because the, the, this is the thing that was happening at the time. was something that was called the War of the Currents. And um, catchy, yeah. It, 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 they they were all into better than the war on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> they were all into um, uh, lots of marketing back then. Uh, because among other things, the, the, the main rival was less uh, Tesla and more who Tesla was working for, a guy called Westinghouse, which uh, you will have seen Westinghouse fridges and, and all the rest. So as, as a brand, he's still around. Um, and so at the time, Westinghouse were, had um, AC uh, distrib- distribution um, for, for um, electricity, which was a rival to Edison's DC. Uh, and so Edison was trying everything that he could to say that AC was was deadly and that you needed the much safer um, DC uh, to the extent that um, at, at some point they were trying to come up with a name for what happens when somebody gets killed by electricity. Today we say electrocution, but at the time they didn't have the word electrocution. And uh, they, they, they actually have a short list of a few that they're going for. One was Westinghouse, uh, which was um, uh, Thomas Edison's favourite. Um, uh, another You've one, been Westinghouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, crim- uh, a criminal was Westinghouse on the weekend. Uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, because at that time, somebody then went, hey, I wonder if we can kill human beings with this and invented the electric chair. And um, the, the person who, uh, who was really spearheading that was called Jerry. And so the, another name that was going around was Jerry Side. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the last name that was going around was uh, somebody else who was actually a, a, a guy called Henry Brown was doing a lot of experiments to demonstrate that AC was as deadly as, as everyone claimed. And so one of the names going around was Browned. You've been Fantastic. browned. Fantastic. Yeah. We're going to use that on this show from now on. Yeah. You've been browned. Hang on. Whoa. People people will assume it means something entirely different and, and possibly yeah, a little bit more wet. because it's me. So <laughs> I'm vetoing this. <laughs> and it sounds all manner of wrong. Um, <laughs> it does. I well, can see why it does stick. Honesty, yeah, I mean, if, if, if somebody does touch an electrical wire, it's it, it probably does describe what happens to them. But, uh, Anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. No, no. Okay, we'll leave that one for the show. But um, on some of the that uh, I've put together for the show, one of the things that I, I was very keen to have was actually a live Tesla coil. So mm-hmm. if anyone's seen one of those, uh, the, the, the local science museum, Science Works here, has a uh, the, the high-voltage theatre with a, a giant Tesla coil. Um, and I've managed to, to get one. Um, it's not as big as the one in, in the... Um, uh, where does one manage to get a Tesla theater? coil from, yes. Sean? Where well, does one I, manage to get one from? Do, they, do, you, do you just go to eBay? Do you, do you just put in an ad in the trading post? Actually, I, I ordered this as a kit online, which, among other things, blew the uh, circuitry in my uh, apartment. Um, right. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you so, on a watch list now somewhere? <laughs> um, very possibly. There has been a van out the place for some time. <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting to brown aside you. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not? <laughs> so the short of it is that I, I haha, oh, sorry, I'll just write that joke down. That's nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I've ended up with a, uh, a Tesla call, which is this thing's really awesome. And you, you turn it on and it puts out um, arcs of electricity, which 
considering the size of it, it it's, it's putting them out about uh, 10, 15 centimetres long, but it's still quite spectacular. Um, but then it's also got a few other tricks up its sleeve, which to find out, you'll have to come along. <laughs> Ever the salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing that. And uh, you're actually offering a bit of a promotion. Are you giving away some tickets to think- the dear listeners of Science on Top? Yeah. If you are in the Melbourne area during Comedy Festival 2019, for those people who are listening to this in 2024, I have five double passes to give away. So if you'd like one of those, Ed, is there someplace where they can email? They can Email feedback at scienceontop.com and we will uh, give the first five uh, people a free ticket. That sounds awesome. No problem. Are they five double or five singles, just to be no. clear? Five double passes. So, um, oh, wow. so the, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you the dates. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got the uh, 30th of March is the opening show and then it's on every weekend until the end of the um Comedy Festival, which is the Easter weekend. And we've got, also got one extra show on Good Friday. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think that's enough promotion for now. <laughs> um, so, let's let's clear the air, shall we? And you know what's supposed to be great for cleaning the air? Houseplants. For a long time, it's been believed that having some potted plants around the house will help filter out pollutants and toxins, but no longer. The evidence is now pointing away from that and in fact suggests that houseplants do very little or even nothing at all when it comes to cleaning the air. Is that right, Penny? Yeah, and I thought this was interesting because I'm no botanist and this is one of the things I'd seen floating around a lot, like just in various things I read that, you know, houseplants will clean the air, um, you know, they get rid of toxins. Sometimes, you know, toxins always triggers my... Hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes it says VOCs, like volatile organic compounds or, you know, things that are too small to be filtered out. I'm like, and then it says studies by NASA have shown and, you know, sometimes a link to the study. I'm like, okay, well, I guess, fair enough. It's something that I guess I never really thought about and I assumed, well, maybe having a plant does clear the air a bit. I mean, it makes sense in a way, like, you know, plants and nature, nature good, <laughs> etc. <cetera>. So, <laughs> but they, and they do have that respiratory function. They turn carbon they dioxide into, into oxygen, that's into oxygen and you know. Yes. And I think psychologically, which is what I'll get back to, is I think a lot of people feel really happy when they're around plants. Like we like looking at green things, and having a house plant inside, as long as you don't tip the stupid thing over, is quite nice. <laughs> like, but. What's really interesting is that this research, which is, you know, pretty much common knowledge now, it was done by NASA and it did indicate that plants might, in fact, help to clear the air, but not in a normal household environment and not at a normal concentration of house plants. So um, the NASA experiments were done, I think, in real, in sealed chambers um i think it was reasonably small 10 feet by 10 feet i might be wrong there whereas our houses are not like that um our houses are not closed closed environments and unless you live on a space station unless you live on a space or a submarine yeah but (laughs) you know we open up our windows and doors all the time there's drafts there's vents and it seems like essentially um just the amount of air that just gets recirculated and swapped from inside and outside would overwhelm any potential effect that houseplants could have. So even though some plants can remove volatile organic compounds or, you know, gases, toxins, um, it's not useful in your home. Even if you kind of jammed in your plants, you would need like in a, in a small room, you'd need to have over a 1,000 plants to have the same effect as just, you know, circulating and changing over the air. So That sounds crowded. It sounds crowded. Like, I mean, I like a nice house plant, but I don't like that sort of jungle <laughs> conservatory feel because you end up with other issues like humidity that's created and, you know, that earthy scent and so on, which can damage furniture. So The it, risk of knocking them over. The risk of the knocking them everywhere. over. Um, and so on. So, so 
So if you think of, um, you know, the level, the amount of houseplant you'd have in your house, even if you're pretty on the, you know, the pretty keen indoor gardening side, compared to the amount of surface area of every other thing, like rugs, cushions, carpets, books, everything you've got, it's just um, insignificant. So have plants because you like them, have plants because they make you feel good. Um, but if you're picking a plant and you think, oh, I should probably get this kind of plant because it's better at clearing the air, don't worry. The plants are not really going to help clear your air. They'll make you feel good so you can choose, you know, a plant that's appropriate for other reasons because you like it because it's not going to poison your pet or so on. Yeah, I think this is... An interesting thing that we don't talk about enough with science is that something can give you results in the lab yeah. that doesn't necessarily translate to real world problems. I mean, it's it's like, you know, this particular substance kills bacteria in the clinical trials. Well, it works in a Petri well, dish. <laughs> didn't we talk about one that lemon juice just completely obliterated HIV? Well, okay. that's great. <laughs> But no. don't, how do we don't use inject that? lemon juice. Don't inject lemon juice. Like, don't. Yeah. So many things you shouldn't do with lemon juice. Um, mm. Yeah. So it's it's interesting, and it could lead to something. Is um, there like a list? Sorry, I'm now curious. What is, is yeah. there? Is this not? Is this something that I feel like there's school? a lot of Penny? personal history that things uh, you shouldn't Penny do has with lemon, lemon juice. juice <laughs> no, I just think just logic. Just logic dictates. Oh, okay. Really. All right. Just think about it. Mm. Okay. There we go. <laughs> I'm thinking about it and I'm really trying not to now. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, with the plants, I mean, it's something that was one of those things that was floating around. It didn't sound crazy. It had a bit of evidence behind it. But when you really look at, you know, real-world applications, not NASA sealed system space station kind of applications, but just because something that's done for a particular situation, the effects just might not translate. I think there is something to be said for if you're in like an office environment and maybe you don't have windows or something, there's a psychological effect of yeah. having some greenery and some natural uh, plants around. But It's probably true. Again, I think having windows has a bigger psychological effect than, than having Absolutely, plants. but yeah. not everyone has that option. I'm just, you know. True. Yeah, so in your panic room, uh, <laughs> let's put lots of plants. <laughs> Well, oh, it, it, someone actually put a pot plant in the ladies' um, bathroom at my work, and it's really quite nice. But I do wonder how long it's going to survive with the light levels in there. Was it just in one of the cubicles, or no, no, just on the end of the bench, like you know where oh, okay. all the sinks are. It's, it's quite nice. I'm like, mm, I should keep an eye on that plant and move it if it looks a bit sickly. Mm, very good. Uh, like I said, it's always just good to have that reminder that. Mm. Clinical trials and lab trials are not necessarily reflective of real-world uh, experiences. And that's the way science is always going to be, I guess. Okay, Sean, let's talk some space stuff. And our best calculation at the moment is that there's around 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Yeah. We also think there's at least one planet orbiting each of them. Obviously, some have no planets and some might have six or seven. But on average, there's about one planet per star. That was our last best guess. Now, a new study suggests there could be an additional 50 billion rogue planets, planets not orbiting any stars. Is that right? That's right. So a paper in the uh, Journal of Astronomy and Astrophysics has uh, um, described an experiment, and it was a, it was a simulation that was done. Uh, and the outcome of this simulation is that there might be 50 billion planets just sort of floating around, roaming free, untethered from uh, it, the, the star that it, it began its life around, somewhere out there in the galaxy. Um, so this, this comes from a, um, a simulation that was done at the University of Leiden. And uh, what, what they were doing was that they were looking uh, specifically at the stars in a local stellar nursery. So stellar nursery is a place where a lot of young stars can be seen being, um, being formed. And this particular one, um, we, we, you can actually see this even, even with a set of binoculars. Um, so in the constellation of Orion, 
and we've got Orion's belt. Just hanging off Orion's belt is his sword, and in that is the the, the Orion Nebula, uh, which you can see uh, as a cloud through um, your binoculars. Now, within the Orion Nebula, there's something that's called the um, the Orion Trapezium, um, and this is a set of stars which uh, uh, Galileo first identified and it turns out it's it's uh, not just four or five stars but actually something in the order of about uh, 2,000 stars um, all in this area who which are very young and in the very early stages of um, of forming uh, of formation and not only that they're they're forming um, solar systems around themselves so Taking uh, the data that they've seen from this area, they've put it into their simulation and um, just watching to see what happens. Uh, and at the end of the simulation, they found uh, they, they simulated about uh, 1,500 stars in this Orion trapezium. And um, of these, there's about uh, 2,500-ish uh, planets orbiting around 500 of the 1,500 stars. And what they found was that the, uh, about 300 to 400 became free-floating uh, within a certain amount of time of, of their evolution. And by free-floating, it's, it's because we've had some collisions happening. These stellar nurseries turn out to be very chaotic places. And, um, you know, stars, uh, planets forming uh, end up colliding with their own stars or perhaps uh, other stars come in contact with um, other forming solar systems. Uh, but from whatever the way that's happened, we're um, out of that. Uh, they've, they've found that around 200, maybe 300, 281 have left their cluster um, and ended up roaming around as free roaming planets out there without a care in the world. I think the, the interesting thing about rogue planets, of course, is that there's no star giving light to them. So it's really hard for us to actually see if they're out there. You know, we can't actually just look for their reflection of the star or their effect on a star. If they're out there in the void, in the darkness, really hard for us to detect them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now that said, that they have um, astronomers have detected a certain number of rogue stars out there. Uh, sorry, rogue um, planets out there, just simply through um, stars changing their the amount of light that they're showing. Um, clearly, something's something's gone gone in front of them. But what's interesting from this uh, is that we now have a, um, a a more perhaps accurate estimate of the number of rogue planets that are out there um, because uh, essentially they've, they've looked at um, the certain types of um, uh, stars that would be forming these uh, planets, worked out that uh, around certain ones that, that, that there'll be a, a number that, that become rogue. And so um, uh, from there they, they just sort of extrapolated from, to, to the rest of the galaxy and come up with this estimate of 50 billion planets. <laughs> You're saying that with your little finger to your lip like Dr. <laughs> Evil, aren't you? <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll have 50 billion free roaming planets. Um, the, these sort of simulations uh, are happening um, more and more in terms of uh, the, the amount of data that we're getting in, but on top of that, the amount of uh, computer processing power that we're able to throw at projects like this. Um, and I, I'm just sort of saying this by way of a segue because um, there is uh, software packages that are available out there. There's more and more that are available for general public just to play around with. Um, there's there's one called Universe Sandbox where you you get to just you know uh, let's replace the, uh, the the sun at the center of our solar system with a black hole and see what happens. I love love playing around with that stuff. That's so much fun. <laughs> so you know I can't help but imagine that the the, the 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 good researchers at the University of Leiden on their time off uh, just you know doing things like you know hey let's let's play billiards with planets. <laughs> well, yeah. That's absolutely right. And we've talked uh, quite a bit on the show before about the use of modeling in science, uh, whether it be astronomical modeling or climate change modeling, or all sorts of things. When you get enough good quality data and you design your si simulation or your modeling well enough, it can be a really accurate 
prediction of what can happen or what has happened, if you will. Um, it's really exciting, actually, when you look at well-run modeling and simulations like that. Mm. Yes. Free roaming planets sounds somewhat less um, foreboding than rogue planets. Rogue <laughs> planets sounds like something that you should fear or that, you know, they're going to get you. Whereas free roaming is a great thing on a phone plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want my mobile yeah. phone to have free roaming around the world, around the galaxy. You see, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just imagining this and I've got the, uh, the, the theme song for the Littlest Hobo playing over the top of it while yeah. these planets are going around. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm just in, uh, so like free roaming sounds like they're not tethered to a star. They're not tied to some other celestial body's agenda. They can do what they want. Mind you, they do can only do what thing. they want in one direction. <laughs> just, just keep on going that one direction. Yeah, until they are eventually swayed by the gravitational force of some other object, yeah, well, in which case... The will they be? Yeah, I they're mean, subject they, they to the... They may well just well. make their way out. I mean, there's so many gaps. There's lots of gaps. You know, it's very gappy. Um, <laughs> it's full of gaps. Full of gaps. <laughs> full of all. Did you notice in the um, Earth Sky story that there was an mm-hmm. artist impression of a rogue planet at the beginning of the story? Why is it glowing? I why want not? to know why it's yeah. glowing. <laughs> is it like a bioluminescence thing or something? What's going on there? Uh, it could be there's electrical atmosphere in a gaseous, uh, electrical activity in the gaseous atmosphere. And or okay. an Instagram filter. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they are free roaming planets. That stands to reason they might be a little bit sort of. Hashtag no filter. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, that's the opposite, isn't it? <laughs> Hashtag no star. Yeah. <laughs> so one other thing uh, was whether the Earth's solar system, whether our sol- solar system has has um, ended up with a planet that's uh, become a rogue planet out there. And, um, and, and chances are, are quite good that there might be one of our uh, our own planets that are out there. Uh, roaming about the place. Um, so from this, they, they've, they've uh, picked out a few different characteristics uh, that might suggest that solar systems may have had uh, a rogue planet um, uh, either be ejected from them um, uh, or have um, have been knocked out by, by something else. And, and it's things like um, uh, angular orbits, and um, other other clues like this. So, yeah. The thing about this story, of course, is it actually ties in really well with an article, Lucas, that you wanted to talk about uh, by Ethan Siegel in Forbes. And that's looking at the mass of the Milky Way compared to the mass of our nearest big galactic neighbour, Andromeda. Yeah, so Andromeda, it's long been assumed, well, not just assumed, it's it's been measured that Andromeda appears to be our our big big cousin. Um, so in the, in our local group of galaxies, there's over there's more than sixty galaxies in our local group. So that's you know it's a pretty pretty crowded region, and and all of this local group appear to also be impacted by um, something that we can't see, which is frustrating. It's called the Great Attractor, um, which to me sounds like something that should have been in a in a Pixar movie, The Great Attractor. But anyway, um, so uh, we're we're all kind of gravitationally interacting with each other. All of these uh, all of these galaxies in our in our local group. That also includes a whole lot of um, globular clusters and dwarf galaxies and a whole lot of other things that are around. Now we. We don't know for sure how massive the Milky Way is. We don't know for sure how many stars are in the Milky Way. You you would hear you know us quoting figures like a hundred thousand light years across, and um, you know the the spiral arms that we have, and we now believe we're in a barred spiral arm galaxy and things like this. Um, mo- most of that information is inferred from what we can see which is actually pretty limited because there's a heck of a lot of dust and other stuff within the galaxy that that blocks out a lot of visible light. So when you look up in the night sky, if you're in a really, really dark 
you know, place, go out to the outback of Australia or something and you look in the night sky, you can see these really awesome dark bands across the the sky when you when you can see the, the Milky Way. And, you know, we've we've talked about Aboriginal astronomy before where the, the dark bands are actually the thing that they, you know, had wove their stories around and things like that. I mean, they're very, very obvious. Well, they're dust. That's actually dust clouds that are blocking the, the visible light. So if you have dust um, particles of just the right size, um, they will absorb or reflect um, light at different wavelengths. So it just so happens that this dust that's in these bands reflects or absorbs a lot of the visible light, which is why we can't see what's behind it. So we can see out to the sides. We know that we're kind of, you know, two thirds of the way out on one of the spiral arms. So we're kind of in the outer, you know, the outer neighborhood. Um, but most of what we know has in the past come from inferring from uh, optical uh, visual um, uh, observations and also other wavelengths of light, for example, like infrared. Um, if you look at the same patch of sky in infrared, you can see different things because, um, again, it comes down to the size of those particles as to what wavelengths of light are absorbed or, or reflected by those particles. So in infrared, we can actually see the bulge of the, the galaxy in, um, in this otherwise quite dark area of space, uh, which is towards the, the centre of our galaxy. So as a result, you know, as I say, a lot of these uh, figures that we have have been um, infer inferences from, from what we can see. And we have another analogue, which is pretty close by, which is, for all intents and purposes, a very close cousin to ours, which is the Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy is, across our sky, is actually huge. You don't realise how big it is because it's really, really dim. You can't see it with your naked eye. But if you could see it with your naked eye, it's over six times the width of the full moon. It's, it's, it's massive. So um, it's, it's quite a, a larger... So the full moon um, takes up about half a degree uh, of... of um, th that's how we measure um, in distances in the sky. We, we talk in degrees. If you imagine 360 degrees being all the way around you, so including under your feet right around the Earth and around the other side... So you've got 180 degrees from horizon to horizon. And so if you segmented those 180 degrees across the sky above you, half a degree is the, is the width of the moon uh, as it appears in the sky. Um, and you've got about, I think it's about six degrees or something like that is the, is the uh, width, or it might be three degrees, sorry, is the width of the Andromeda. So it's quite a bit um, broader than, um, than, than the moon, but it is very dim. So we observe it with instruments and we can observe it in pretty high fidelity. It's, it's a, it's an awesome looking, um, galaxy. We, we have the luxury of looking at it, um, pretty much from the, the top or the bottom, depending on how you define it. Um, so we can see these beautiful spiral arms. It's just a gorgeous thing to look at. Um, but we can see a lot of detail because it's so close to us and by close, I mean, you know, everything's relative, right? So um, the, the Andromeda galaxy is about 2 million light years away from us. But uh, in, galac you know, in, 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 in uh, terms of the universe, that's really, really close. That's, that's right. Just you know, around the corner. Neighborhood. Just around the corner. It's like a run to the milk bar. So as a result, we, can, we, we know a lot about Andromeda. We can, we can more or less count the stars in Andromeda um, based on observing, uh, you know, optically, which is, which is pretty cool. So... Generally speaking, Andromeda has been uh, estimated to have significantly more stars than the Milky Way galaxy. So, for example, the Milky Way we know has got some somewhere between 200 to 400 billion stars, we, we, we believe. Mm -hmm. um, we're about 25,000 light years from the center. So, as I mentioned, it's about 100,000 light years across based on what we, we've measured. Um, in comparison, the Andromeda galaxy um, has somewhere between um, s potentially up to a trillion stars. So it's a oh. you know yeah a significantly greater number of stars, and that's based predominantly on observations in in the optical and the infrared. So the Spitzer Space Telescope, for example, uh, is one of the instruments that that counted up uh, approximately a trillion stars. Uh, in the Andromeda galaxy. So, 
you know, <laughs> it's it's quite a, a significant difference in the numbers of stars. So um, what does this mean? Well, if we compare just the numbers of stars, that does appear to be the case based on extrapolating from what we can see in our own sky for our own galaxy, uh, assuming a you know roughly even distribution of stars across the various spiral arms. Um, but what has not or had not been overly considered for both of these galaxies in comparison with, with each other was the mass of the galaxies. So the mass of the galaxies is a bit more interesting. If you consider all of the material in the galaxies, as we now know, there's a lot more to galaxies than simply the luminous material. There's all the other material that's not luminous, and the other, um, you know, baronic matter that's that's the dust and the you know the the gases and all that sort of stuff that that aren't burning, that that aren't that aren't uh, uh, stars, but there's also dark matter. So we know dark matter from what? How do we observe dark matter? This is a question for the for the team. How do we know? How do how do we how do we observe dark matter? We don't observe dark matter itself. We usually observe its effect on other things, such as how galaxies are not spiraling apart. Right. So we infer <laughs> dark matter from the, the gravitational Ten points to Gryffindor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so worried I was going to get kept in detention. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So so we, we infer it based on the, on the gravitational impact that it has. So... We can, although we can't really see inside the Milky Way overly well because we're in it, so it's kind of hard to see, we can actually look outside of the Milky Way and see the Milky Way's effect on the stuff around it. So the galaxies have got what's known as a halo. It's the other stuff that's basically orbiting the galaxy. It has The galaxy has quite a, an extended influence on the areas around it. And from the interactions and the movements of those things around the Milky Way, we can actually start to get at some sort of measurement or calculation as to the overall mass of the Milky Way. And that's where stuff really gets interesting. So the Andromeda Galaxy seems to be an older galaxy than ours. It has fewer star-forming regions. It has much older stars in it. We've got a lot of star-forming regions, and we've, we can measure this through a whole variety of different ways. There's, there's spectra that, that help us with this stuff. There's, um, you know, looking at um, things like the, the nebulae, like uh, before, Sean, you mentioned the Orion Nebulae, a planet-forming, oh, sorry, a planetary nebula, which is a, a, like a stellar nursery. Um, so we, we can see these in our own galaxy much more abundantly than we can see them in Andromeda. Um, but we also appear to have, for reasons that are not yet clear, quite a lot more mass than Andromeda. It could be over twice as much mass as Andromeda, which is really, really interesting and really caught my attention because this is this sort of bucks against the trend of, of everything I've read over the years about Andromeda being our big cousin. Yeah. So, so we don't have certainties yet obviously there's there's a lot more to be observed a lot more to be analyzed but there's certainly something going on here that indicates that we have significantly more mass than andromeda and where that mass is and how that mass is interacting with other things that's something that will hopefully come out over time but very very cool i was really surprised to read this story yeah because at some point you get to you get to a point where the maths just doesn't add up. I mean, the Milky Way is about half the width of the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. and with much fewer stars, like two hundred to four hundred billion compared to a trillion. But how can it weigh more? Then how can it have more mass? That is well, that's the thing. And as I say, this is where this is where things like dark matter can come into the equation, and and we've seen some. I mean, the there's nothing that makes sense about dark matter when you every time we learn more about it it's like wait what do you remember we talked about <laughs> a, a, a globular cluster which appeared to have become divorced from its dark matter there was a dark matter halo that was basically yeah. offset from that globular like a shadow cluster. yeah right i mean what the hell <laughs> <laughs> What causes that? Can you, I mean, uh, seriously, what causes that? That's just bizarre. Um, so, 
Yeah, I I love this stuff, and I, and I and I often talk about on the show how much I love the way that we can infer the stuff that we do. I just I, it just amazes me that that we can we can look at all of this stuff that's orbiting our galaxy and use that to start to 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 reverse engineer how massive our galaxy must be. That's just incredible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. It's once again, it's big data meets modeling and simulation meets better technology and understanding of things when it all comes together. It's, it's what makes good science. Yep. And uh, back down to Earth where a new study published in the journal Science finds that before agriculture, when humans were nomadic, hunter-gatherers, Languages didn't have the same sounds that they do now. In fact, some sounds just weren't even possible. Penny, back then, people really couldn't give an F, could they? <laughs> I like that. Uh, thank you. Of your, one of my favourite segues ever. Um, I love this kind of story. I've always been interested in the reconstruction of ancient languages and I've loved reading about, um, you know, the ancient ancestor of uh, English, which is a language called Proto-Indo-European. It's also the ancient ancestor of Sanskrit and Latin and a lot of other language families, which is really cool. It's not the only ancient language family, but it's one of the best studied. But what's really interesting is this idea that after language evolved, which was probably at least 50,000 years ago, it could be a lot before that, is that biology hasn't really had an effect on the kinds of the sounds that we made. And what I think is really interesting about this study is it looks at a way that our biology and our behaviour and the way that, you know, our agricultural behaviour, our talking or linguistic behaviour and our biology kind of intersect to make this suggestion that maybe sounds like f and v weren't part of human language or weren't regularly part of human language until farming appeared. So that sounds like a really weird connection to make. The idea is that the kind of diet that you eat if you live in an agricultural society is a bit more processed, a bit softer, uh, less wear on your teeth, um, preserving food, having more grains, having more consistent foods, uh, easier to eat. And this apparently affects the way that your jaw bites together. So humans are born with overbites and overjets, and that means that your top teeth generally come down over your bottom teeth, and they're more forward than the bottom teeth. So you know how sometimes when little kids are trying to smile and they don't really know how to do it on purpose for a camera, they line up their teeth together. It looks really weird. I love that. Yeah, I it know. Looks like so <laughs> but, you know, so that's sort of how we kind of think of teeth, but they're not really like that. So our, our front teeth fit over our lower jaws. And the idea is that the more wear on your teeth, like might be common in a hunter-gatherer kind of society that, you know, you'd see in the pre-Neolithic that all humans would have lived in, your jaws kind of shift and your teeth are more in that edge-to-edge alignment. So the, the theory is that if you make a sound like th or v, that involves putting your top teeth against your lower lip. So if you just try it, th, v, th, v, you can see that that's that position. But if your teeth are aligned a bit differently without an overbite, that sound is going to be a bit more difficult to make and would be yeah. less likely to be included in language. And what's really interesting is, I mean, this is an idea, but one way to check it and what they looked at is they looked at the, the sound systems of languages across the world and compared it to the way the subsistence styles are the way that they get their food and found that, you know, about half of the languages do have these sounds in them. Just because you can make the sound doesn't mean it's going to happen. I think Japanese, for example, doesn't have it at all. They definitely have agriculture. But On average, and again, this is averages, statistics, probabilities, hunter-gatherer societies used fewer than a third the number of these sounds as their agricultural counterparts. So as well as comparing it to um, 
modern societies in terms of looking at hunter-gatherers, or not modern, but languages that um, are attested with hunter-gatherers and people who have agriculture, they also looked at a really well-researched language family, um, Indo-European. And this language family, it's the one that, um, if you think about languages, like we know that the Romance languages, for example, French and Italian um, and Spanish, derived from Latin, and you can really see the links between Latin and those Romance languages. If you go further back, you can see links between, um, you know, Latin and then the ancestors of English. And if you go further back, there's links with Sanskrit as well. And this whole group of languages are known as the Indo-European language family. So just like French and Italian and Spanish came from Latin, you can say, you know, everything from English to German, um, French, Spanish, Italian, Sanskrit, modern, you know, languages come from this language Indo-European family. And it's thought that the ancestor of that language, um, which we've called Proto-Indo-European, probably existed somewhere in Eurasia. I'm not going to get too specific. About 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. And the estimate is that these foot and verse sounds went from about 3% in that language from from the way and this is not has not been re reconstructed for this study it has been reconstructed you know over a long period of scholarship so three percent in the proto language to about 76 percent in the languages that are being spoken or that you know we have evidence for now which suggests you can't that, put that down to chance can you well, that's i mean maybe well, you probably chance, can but but it, but it's a significant increase. Yeah, it, it does suggest that perhaps there's a link or there is something that maybe is linked to agriculture and these different sounds. Now, I'm not really a linguist. I'm not really an anthropologist. I don't really have the background knowledge to, you know, critique this subject. It was published in Science that suggests that we should definitely take it mm -hmm. very seriously. But what I do find really interesting is the way that it puts biological factors back into our culture and back into our language because we often feel like you know these fields of study are so separate that once we've you know reached this level of cultural evolution that our biology doesn't necessarily have much effect on us or we can change it or we shouldn't in a way, think about it because then we're saying that our biology determines who we are and that thought can be quite mm. uncomfortable. And I think no one's saying that, oh, a language that has these particular sounds in it is more expressive or better or anything. It's no. just a difference, a difference. that, yep. you know, has arisen. But there's also, there's also that thing where we tend to sort of think, well, humans haven't evolved from, you know, a hundred thousand years ago or whatever we've been the same ever since then when of course two thirds or one third of us have developed the ability to uh process lactose yeah. after for six months or whatever and there's probably a lot of other changes and this is possibly one of those evolutionary changes where our mouth and our jaws and things have just been slightly altered and that's a result of that maybe but I don't even know if it's an inherited thing. I mean, it, it, from what I was reading, it it seems like it is just a use change. So the way that you use your um, your mouth determines the way that your jaw fits together, which then determines which sounds are more natural for you to make. I thought this was really interesting. I would love um, to keep following it because it's it's the sort of thing you, you read the headline, you think. How on earth could anyone <laughs> possibly have any way of making suggestions about that? Yeah, because I guess also if you're talking the bone structure and things, we can maybe look at fossil evidence, not fossil, but you know what I mean, uh, archaeological evidence of structural changes in that. But when we're also talking of the soft palate and the gums and the t tongue and things like that, yeah. that's not going to be preserved over thousands of years, so we don't have a very good idea of how they may have just been different. So it's also interesting from the point of view of um, uh, the tools that a mm. uh, 
we have in terms of making sound to communicate to one another and that you know somewhere along the line that two people agreed that this particular sound is going to mean, mean this um and the the range of languages across the world in terms of um the the emphasis that some languages have on particular vowel sounds compared to others to the extent that uh, someone from one culture has difficulty picking up the, the language from another because they've they've grown up with a particular way of and they've they've practiced a particular yeah. way of speaking yeah. and uh, I, I just want to add one more thing which was the um, uh, like the the African tribes who used uh, clicks and knocks um, which is uh, something that that seems to be quite unique um, uh, in, in uh, that part of the world um, uh, but yeah again you know um, the, these these uh, in, 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 a, in a way kind of like all of these different um, tools that are that are open to us as an evolving creature with evolving language that we that, that eventually becomes a language yeah i think it's all it's fascinating and as you say penny i like when we get a different story like this that actually looks at almost two un, what we tend to think of as mm. being unrelated mm. fields you know the biology and then there's the linguistics and merges the two and sees what overlaps there might be between the two it's that's always interesting. And I think that's our show. So, as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 327. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Sean, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, yes, hope to see you at the show. Definitely. Don't forget, you can email feedback at scienceontop.com to claim a free ticket to Tesla, Death Rays and Elephants at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. So that'll be five, two passes to uh, see the show. And can I just add um, that if you do miss out on one of those passes, I, I, it's, it's on during the, uh, the comedy festival on every weekend at four o'clock. Uh, at the Imperial Hotel, which is down on Spring Street, just outside Parliament. And we'll have a link to the Comedy Festival page for people to check that out as well. Best of luck with that, Sean. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. astronauts didn't have enough to worry about in space, we now have one more thing to add to that list. Herpes. A recent study published in Frontiers in Microbiology from the folks over at the Johnson Space Center reports that dormant herpes viruses have been found to reactivate or wake up in over half the crew on space shuttle and ISS missions. Keep in mind that space didn't actually give the astronauts herpes, but rather reactivated dormant strains that were already pre-existent.